Good morning. How are we doing this morning? Good. We got at least one person that's good. No. We're just thanking the Lord for the strength that he gave us to get out of bed. I think, I think that's what I was doing this morning. It's like, thank you, Lord, for the, for the strength to just get up and, and come to worship this morning. Um, let's stand to our feet. We're going to begin worship in just a moment. I'm just going to read part of Romans uh, 10 over you guys. This has actually been a verse we, we talked about. Um, I can't remember if this was in youth group. This might have been, this might not have been a youth group. Um, but either way, um, I thought it was fitting since we were going to get to hear from some people that live overseas today. We are going to, um, this verse is Romans 10, 15. And how will anyone go and tell them without being sent? That's why the scriptures say, how beautiful are the feet of messengers who bring good news. Um, I've had that verse and just all of Romans 10 kind of on my brain in the last week or so. And uh it kind of gave me a little bit of, of courage to kind of just pray a little bit extra for, for all the overseas workers that either A, we support, or B, that we know, um, especially hearing from some of our, our church family that have been um, on different trips this summer, um, missions and otherwise, internships, things like that. Um, but just how great is our God to send us and to use us when he doesn't have to. Um, and that goes for just even day-to-day -day life, for going out and telling our friends, our neighbors, our family members how precious the blood of our Jesus is to cover us and to, to redeem us. And that is good, good news. So with that in mind, let's just go into a time of worship. We're going to sing out, um, Oh, Precious is the flow so you guys know this song so please just sing this out with us
Good morning, as I fall down the stairs. Man, what an amazing thing. And it, as we were listening to this song, I was thinking about the, the series that we're doing with the students about being the salt of the earth, right? And what, what it means to be salt and, and why God leaves us here in this craziness. And, you know, we're here to add value. And we're here to add value not only to the world but to each other. And what a great thing it is as we gather together to worship, as we get to hear what God is doing not only in our own city but in the entire world. And that's what it's all about. And that's what we're, we're worshiping this morning. We're, we're thanking the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, for all that he's doing. And it's just exciting to think about that, right? It's exciting to think about what he's doing in us and through us. And at National Hills, that's our only desire, right, to connect you to that Jesus, to know him, to have that relationship, to understand the intimacy that he wants with you. And then to be able to be in community, to live it out, to share all that he's doing. And then, as we're going to get here a little bit later, to be able to bring that message to the world. And that's, that is just awesome. So as we continue to worship this morning, if you're visiting with us, if you're watching for the first time online, please let us know how we can serve you, so you know how we can love on you, how we can pray for you. And let's continue to worship together. Um, we have a song for you guys this morning. This is um, a song that... Well, in my opinion, <laughs> Melinda told me it's it, that she might disagree just a scotch. I think it's super easy, um, but we sang this song out at at youth camp, and um, I was telling the worship team this morning that that I've been really reflecting on on worship and on music and so many worship songs and even hymns that we that we sing and that we worship to are very like personal and very almost introspective to think through and oh well, how how has God blessed me and how do I respond to God's faithfulness to me um, and and my heart has been recently just so much to like let's sing those praises back and and sing out how good He is and and a little bit less introspective I guess about ourselves and just make it so much more about Him um, not that worship is not a part of also reflecting on the goodness and the faithfulness of how good He is to us do not hear me say that because that is a huge part of worship. But actually saying the names of God in your, in your prayer time and in your worship time and actually singing out that we praise you, we lift your name high. And then you're going to hear that this, this song says that, that this is what, let's see, the, the bridge says, this is what living looks like. Living in worship. This is what freedom feels like. Being freed from our chains and have, having the freedom not only to be able to, to worship freely, but to be able to come and meet in a building in freedom. This is what it feels like. This is what it feels like. But also, this is what the freedom from our, our sin feels like in a huge, huge way. And then it says, this is what heaven sounds like. And we praise you. That is, that is the, the message of this song. And um, I guess uh, since losing my mom, thinking about the idea of worshiping with those in heaven has meant a whole lot more to me. And thinking of the fact that, that the praises that she sings for eternity and has been singing for a year now um, are look a little different than the ones that I'm singing right now. But they're together around the throne in a different way. Um, so let's just sing this song out when you get it. It's, it like I said, it's, it's very easy, but it, the whole message of this song is that we are praising him. And that is, that is our goal and that is our, that is our purpose. Giants fall, fear cannot survive when we pray. 
so they've been like say this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what living looks like this is what freedom feels like this is what heaven sounds like we praise you we praise you this is what
join me in prayer. Father, we're so grateful that it is you who saves and redeems till the end, and that you who've begun a good work in us will be faithful to complete it into the day when which we see Christ Jesus. God, we're grateful that you are faithful to us even when we are faithless because you cannot deny your own self and character. We're grateful, Lord, that you will complete what you've done. So, Lord, we praise you. God, we know that uh, we're frail and in need and desperate and accept and apart from you, we have no hope. But in Christ, we have you, the hope of glory. And we thank you, Lord, that you have, that you have knit us together in Christ in who is in God, seated at the right hand of God. Thank you, Lord, that we are secure in you. So we come rejoicing because of the finished work of Christ through his death and resurrection, and we rejoice that you use us even now to impact this world and to bring about your kingdom in this world. So we trust you, Lord. Speak to our hearts through your word. Speak to us. We pray through your Holy Spirit. And we'll commit and consecrate ourselves to you in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Kids, you can head to Children's Church at the back at this time. And uh, Chris, if you wanted to bring them in right at the end, uh, they'll hear an update um, in the last five or ten minutes. Uh, so you're welcome to do that. Uh, we're grateful for uh, Chris leading our children in Children's Church. Um, and then uh, let me encourage you to be ready to hear God's word and at the end of the service, hear a report about what God's doing around the world. I want to introduce to you a dear, longtime friend of mine. Uh, Troy Josie is coming in just a moment to preach the word. Many of you have known Troy for a number of years. He and Kristen have uh, shared what God's doing through them and in them and around the world. Uh, he's going to share the word, uh, and then at the conclusion of the live stream, he's going to share, they're going to share a little report about what's going on around the world. But please help me welcome Troy uh, and Kristen Joshi back to uh, the States and back to National Hills Baptist Church as Troy comes to bring the Word of God. So we're ready? Yeah, come on, brother. You're live and ready to go. So let's, uh, uh, Troy is uh, just graduated, by the way, uh, from uh, Southern and has finished his doctorate. Uh, so congratulations on that as well, brother. We look forward to hearing the Word from you today. Well, good morning, everyone. Okay. Thanks for uh, such a wonderful introduction, Kevin. Uh, it's good to see you and be here this morning. We just thank the Lord that uh, we can be here with you and uh, just worship the Lord together. And so uh, just want to jump right in and want to share with you some culture, want to share with you from God's Word and a little bit of our experience over the past uh, few years uh, through, uh, through what I have this morning, what God's uh, put on my heart. And so uh, the title of this is The Great Mediator, uh, Peace and Reconciliation uh, Through Jesus Christ. And God's been teaching us a lot of things over the past few years, and this is uh, one of the uh, biggest things I would say that God has, has taught me personally, and I think you'll begin to understand that as I, as I share with you uh, the story. So I'm going to intertwine a story and some scripture, and, and so hopefully uh, it'll all make sense at the end, and I think it will. So... Uh, now, again, I just want to share with you this morning about what God's been teaching me over the past uh, few years. I've, I've been a believer in Jesus since the age of 10, and I've understood that Jesus is called many, many things in the Scriptures. He's called the Almighty One. He's called the Alpha and the Omega. He's called our Advocate. He's the author and perfecter of our faith. He's the Bread of Life. He's the Beloved Son of God. He's the Bridegroom. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the faithful one, the true one. He's our good shepherd. He's the great high priest and the, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the light of the world. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the Messiah. He's our hope. He's our peace. He's the sacrifice for our sins. And certainly he is our savior. Well, God has helped me to better understand what it means for Jesus to be called our mediator, our mediator. And I want to pause for just one second before I read the scripture, and I'd like for us just to pray together. Lord, thank you for um, this time together that you've, you've just brought us together as your people and your children. 
And Lord, we're just thankful, so thankful, Lord, for your grace and mercy. Lord, for the peace that you give us in our hearts as we cast all of our anxieties upon you. Lord, we just worship you this morning and thank you and praise you for salvation through Jesus Christ and through Jesus Christ alone. Lord, I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart would be pleasing in your sight this morning. We ask you, Lord, to, to teach us, to change our hearts. Lord, help us to throw aside anything that's hindering us in the race that you set before us so that we can run with perseverance. And Lord, so that we can focus more fully on the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we ask your spirit to move among us and teach us and draw us closer to yourself. Lord, we, we just we love you and praise you as your children. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. So I want to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 5 through 6 this morning. It says this, For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Jesus Christ, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the, which is the testimony given at the proper time. See, the Middle East, where we live, is, is immersed in history that truly extends to biblical times. The language, the culture, it carries much of the imagery that we, that we read about in the scriptures. And for those of us who are from a Western cultural context, we often don't completely understand these types of things the way that someone in the Middle East would understand these types of things. On August 18th, 2019, my family and I were driving on a divided highway in the Middle East. The kids had just had a dentist appointment, and everything went great, if you can imagine that. We were driving home, listening to some worship music when we passed by a small village. We were driving about 60 to 70 kilometers per hour when we saw a woman with her two young sons standing in the middle of the highway. We had seen them cross the highway from the left side, and they they stopped in the middle of the highway on a very, very small median. As our car approached, one of the boys broke free from his mother's hand and ran right into traffic. We slammed on the brakes and we skidded. The boy ran past the driver's side of our car, but we hit him when he reached the passenger side. And we actually ran over him. And we felt the car run over him, and my wife screamed like I'd never heard her scream before. When the car stopped, we could hear his mother screaming, and a, a crowd of men were gathering around our car. I, I immediately got out of the car, expecting to, to see the boy's body behind the car. Well, the boy wasn't. He was, he was up underneath the car. I went to the right side of the car, and we saw that he was on the underside of the passenger seat side of the car, and I thought, I thought he had died. Men began pulling on the boy and yanked him out from under the car, and then a man walked up to me and he instructed me to, to put the boy in our car with his mother and brother and take him to the hospital about five kilometers away. Well, I was in shock, but I could function. Uh, Kristen immediately began calling our friends for help, uh, one of the first people she called was our landlord, who is the leader of his tribe, and he treats us almost like family. Kristen called several of our other Arab friends to let them know what had happened and, and ask for help. And you have to understand that this is a tribal society, so we needed to call our Arab friends for help and not the police. So the mother picked up the boy, climbed into the passenger seat. Kristen grabbed the other boy and climbed into the hatchback of our car. The boy was unconscious and he was moaning, but he was alive. There was blood, as you can imagine, and his arm was clearly broken, and we think that's where we actually ran him over. His mother and younger brother were crying and wailing. A few minutes later, we arrived at the hospital, and a man came out of the emergency department, picked up the boy, and carried him upright into the hospital. And shortly after this, our, our landlord arrived. He told us to leave the hospital immediately because the boy's mother's tribe was beginning to show up at the hospital. Now in the Middle East today, when there is a conflict, such as a, a member of one tribe being injured by another tribe, blood revenge may quickly follow. 
Unless an agreement is reached, tribes may retaliate against each other and more blood will be shed. Uh, these blood feuds are ingrained into tribal culture and therefore into Middle Eastern culture, and they're also essential to the judicial system in this part of the world. Well, after dropping Kristen and the kids off at home, I went to the police station to report the accident and turn myself in and wait. I was accompanied by a, a local pastor from another local tribe. My landlord was there. I, I learned that I needed to wait for the little boy's dad, whose name is Abu Khalid. Needed to wait for him, who had to sign a paper stating that he would not retaliate against me or my family. So I was waiting next to a jail cell under guard in the police station, largely for my own protection. Hours went by, local friends and colleagues showed up and, and joked with the police. The, the police chief talked to the doctor at the hospital and reported to me that the boy just had a broken arm and a few lacerations, which didn't make any sense to me at the time because I know what I saw, I know what my wife saw. The boy was under our car. Well, after waiting about seven hours at the police station, Abu Khalid arrived from a village about two hours south of our city. He was a Bedouin man in his 60s. He appeared to be in very good spirits. He was quite a jolly fellow. Sat down right next to me. He had already visited his son at the hospital to see his condition, and then he had come to the police station and signed a paper that he would not retaliate against me or my family. I agreed to pay all the medical bills for the boy, so our agreement was made in the presence of police officers and those who were helping me through the situation. Now, throughout the Bible, there is a concept of a covenantal meal or a peace meal. These meals demonstrate agreement, restoration, and reconciliation between two parties who were previously enemies. Among the Bedouin in the Middle East, there is a tradition called a sulha, a sulha, which is a reconciliation meal. When there is a blood feud, members of the two tribes sit down to a meal together. The guilty party confesses their sin and apologizes. The offended party accepts the apology and extends forgiveness. Then a peace price is negotiated between the two parties. And this can take anywhere from a few hours to a few days or even weeks. Following an agreement, the offense is not to be brought up again. It's finished. That's the end of it. Never again to be mentioned by anybody. Now we can see this tradition of a sulha throughout the scripture. Eating together was a way to renew a covenant or restore fellowship with one another. In Genesis chapter 14, verses 17 through 24, Melchizedek brought bread and wine and met with Abram and the king of Sodom. In this passage, they negotiated peace with one another, with Melchizedek as a mediator. In Genesis 31, we read about the disagreement between Jacob and Laban, and in the end, they shared a covenantal meal. We see that in verses 54 and 55. The Israelites celebrated the Passover as a remembrance of God's faithfulness, a covenant meal in Exodus 12. It says, This day shall be for you a memorial day, and you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord throughout your generations. As a statute forever, you shall keep it as a feast. Exodus chapter 12, verse 14. Psalm 23, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. The good shepherd prepares a table before the psalmist in the presence of his enemies, chapter or verse 5. This text is often interpreted that God provides safety and security even when there are enemies around. However, I believe this is a reference to a sulha, a reconciliation meal. The enemies are present in this passage not as a witness or attackers being held back, but as those being reconciled to their enemy by the great mediator. In Luke chapter 15, verses 11 through 31, we read about the prodigal son. In the end of this passage, the father kills the fattened calf and celebrates the return of his son. The community is bearing witness to the father's costly celebration for the sake of his son, who was lost and now is found. The imagery of a meal and reconciliation continues in the New Testament when the resurrected Christ eats breakfast with his disciples. Following breakfast, he talks to Peter, who had betrayed him, John 21, 9 through 19. Although this is not a formal sulha, the intimacy and fellowship of sharing a meal together is immediately followed 
by his restoration and the commissioning of Peter to service. This fits into the broader cultural context. Jesus breaks bread with many people throughout the Gospels, and this is viewed as more than just a meal. It is viewed as a relational act of fellowship and communion. In Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, it says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and I will eat with him and he with me. Jesus offers fellowship and communion in this passage. I understand that not all the examples above in Scripture follow the exact pattern of a formal sulha as it's practiced today. However, this biblical pattern of a covenantal meal or reconciliation meal is present throughout the Scriptures. The cultural practice of a sulha achieves reconciliation and peace when the cost is blood. For each of us here today, there is a cost to our fellowship with God, and that was paid for by blood. God achieves this in our lives through the work of Christ, who is our mediator. He is our good shepherd who sets a table before us in the presence of our enemies. He celebrates the son he's found in the community, declaring the restoration in their relationship. He eats with tax collectors. He eats with sinners. Well, my story did not end when Abu Khalid signed the papers that day, and I was able to go home. As the guilty party, my landlord and I were responsible to provide meals to Abu Khalid and his family. My landlord and I visited the little boy in the hospital many, many times and brought him clothes and gifts. My landlord and I attended his doctor's appointments and I was responsible for finding and purchasing for him the right medications. Throughout all of the details, my landlord was my guide. He was my advocate. And he was the mediator between our families. My landlord even surrendered his own ID card to the police, and he swore to the police that if I failed to fulfill my end of the agreement, such as paying for the boy's medical expenses, or if I left the country, that he would take the penalty upon himself, and he would be put in jail. The following July, 11 months after the car accident, I received a call from my landlord stating that I needed to come to the court immediately or else I was going to be put in jail. Well, after a tense drive to the court, I learned that I had missed a court date, which they had failed to tell us about, and I needed to go to jail for a month or pay a fine, so I decided I would pay the fine. I also learned that there was a problem. Abu Khalid had not come to court or formally declared that the case could be closed, so the judge's hands were tied, and she could not close the case. Abu Khalid would not answer his phone. And with an open case, I could not get a residency permit and would continue to have legal issues and problems. Well, my landlord decided after another day in court where Abu Khalid did not show up yet again that he and I should go find Abu Khalid. And so began our hunt for Abu Khalid. So after court, we got into the car with our nice clothes on, drove over two hours south of our city to a small village. It was near his home there. When we arrived at the village, my landlord began asking people, where is Abu Khalid? And we were instructed to go Tat il Jabal, go down the mountain. He lives down the mountain. Just go down the mountain. So we got out of the car, began hiking down the mountain in the July heat, dressed for a court appearance, we wove our way through some ancient ruins. We saw a couple of tents, but no one was in the tents, and there was only barren desert. As we turned around to walk back to our car, we saw a young man standing among the ruins. We approached him, and my landlord asked him who he was, and we learned that he was one of Abu Khalid's many sons. My landlord took the young man's phone, called Abu Khalid from the son's phone, and Abu Khalid finally answered the phone. As the hunt for Abu Khalid continued, we drove into the desert. It was completely desolate and deserted until we came upon two tents out in the middle of the desert. Standing in front of one of the tents was Abu Khalid. He invited us to come in, and we sat on the ground with his sons. The little boy was there, mostly healed. He had, he had grown up a lot of the nine months since I had last seen him. He had scars, but he had mostly healed. 
We were immediately served coffee when we sat down. Well, my landlord took the cup of coffee, and instead of drinking it, he immediately placed it on the ground in front of him and was stiff-necked. This meant that my landlord refused Abu Khalid's hospitality. So Abu Khalid began questioning my landlord, why aren't you drinking? What's wrong? What's happening? Within the culture, it is an insult to refuse food or drink from your host. Abu Khalid basically said that he would do anything in order for my landlord to accept his hospitality. Well, this began a dialogue between the two men. My landlord, acting as my mediator, explained that I had been honorable. I had paid for the medical bills. I had visited them in the hospital. I had provided meals. I had given gifts. And yet the court case could not be closed because he did not appear before the judge. My landlord began questioning Abu Khalid's actions. He had signed the paper in the police station stating he did not demand revenge or money or, or a blood debt, yet he would not close the case. Abu Khalid continued to urge us to drink, to have peace, but my landlord refused. Instead, he said that they should call his lawyer, tell him that the case can be closed, and he is demanding nothing else. Abu Khalid agreed to do this immediately so that we would feel welcome and at peace in his home. When this agreement was made, we drank the coffee, whereby accepting Abu Khalid's hospitality. After we drank coffee, his lawyer was called. My landlord put it on speakerphone so that all of his sons who were sitting there were witnesses to the conversation. Abu Khalid told his lawyer that he is not holding anything against me and to go ahead and close the case. As soon as the call ended, my landlord told one of Abu Khalid's sons to quickly go and make tea. My landlord, myself, Abu Khalid, and his sons drank tea together to make our agreement official. There was peace, there was reconciliation, and this was our sulha. The debt was paid, the legal case was closed. My landlord had been my negotiator, my mediator through the entire process. Through this, I was able to see a glimpse, a small glimpse of what Jesus had done for me through my landlord's actions. Jesus is our mediator, and not only the mediator, but he also pays the debt on our behalf by offering himself as a sacrifice for our sins. We have offended and sinned against a holy and righteous God. A blood debt has to be paid. This is what we owe to God, and Jesus tells us that I'm the way, I am the truth, and I am the life, and no one comes to the Father except by me. Jesus is the only one who can pay this blood debt. And just like in the sulha, Jesus pays your debt, and all your offenses are forgiven. Your relationship with God is restored, and you once again have fellowship and communion together with God. Jesus offers this salvation to everyone. We're all part of a sulha, every one of us. Jesus is our mediator, and he is also our blood payment, our ransom. He did this freely for us, offering us eternal life with God. Our role in this is to either accept Jesus or reject him. This is a present-day reality of our life in Christ, but we also anticipate a coming reality that we will be even more that will be even more vivid with the marriage supper of the lamb that we see in Revelation chapter 19 verses 6 through 9 So if you're not reconciled to God through our great mediator and the one who paid for our sin you need to be reconciled to Christ We've sinned against a holy God and we're guilty The cost of our sin is death and Jesus is our substitute taking the cost of our sin on the cross. Further, he is our mediator, representing us before God the Father. Through his finished work on the cross, he brings about peace, reconciliation, and relationship between a holy God and sinful man. If you've not forgiven your brother or are holding things against your brother, you do need to forgive him, forgive her, I understand this is a process and does not happen overnight, but forgiving one another is part of our calling as followers of Christ. 
Further, if you're not reconciled to your brother, you need to be. I, I realize that reconciliation is not always possible as it requires willingness, humility, and commitment from more than one person. And when we're not unified, we fight, we quarrel. When we fail to love our brothers and sisters within the church, the cost is great. It hurts our fellowship with Christ when we hold on to unforgiveness. Bitterness grows in our, in our hearts and sin multiplies in our own lives. It hurts our brothers and sisters within the church. Gossip and slander, keeping a record of wrongs, dissension. It hurts our witness to those outside the church. Over the past three years, my wife and I have seen that one of the most significant barriers to people understanding the gospel is disunity within the body of Christ. And I'm not saying this is easy. We've all sinned against others and we all have suffered because others have sinned against us and we're all broken. But God in his sovereignty has called us to walk alongside one another. We need each other personally and corporately as the body of Christ. This is not something that we can do in our power, but through the power of the Holy Spirit as we abide in him. And if you're able, live at peace and be reconciled to those outside the church. Romans chapter 12 says, If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written... Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be condemned or do not overcome. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. Once again, there is no guarantee that your effort to live in peace with all men will lead to peace. But as a follower of Christ, we should strive to love our enemies and not return evil with evil. Prayerfully, we should desire all people to come to repentance and follow our good shepherd and mediator. Next time you take the Lord's Supper, remember. Remember the Passover, God's supernatural deliverance of his people from Egypt. Remember Jesus and his disciples at that last Passover meal as Jesus broke bread with them, including the one who betrayed him. Remember the Lord's death until he comes. Remember the blood debt that you have no possibility of ever paying on your own. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, who is the testimony, which is the testimony given at the proper time. And just as we have been forgiven, reconciled, and restored by God through Christ, we have a lesson to learn from the sulha on how we can also forgive and be reconciled to others. There's so much brokenness in this world. We are sinners, but we are also sufferers. We're guilty of sinning against others, and we have been sinned against. There's a certain beauty in the, in the Middle Eastern culture in this formal agreement that brings about forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration of relationships. And for many of us here today, we do have broken relationships with friends and family members, perhaps fellow members of our church. Be reconciled with them. Be reconciled with God through our great mediator, Jesus Christ, by accepting him as Lord and Savior and submitting your life to him. And I'll read it one more time. For there is one God, and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for the gift of salvation through Christ, who is our great mediator. Lord, through him we know that we have access to you and that we will be with you for an eternity, Lord, and we look forward to that. The marriage supper of the Lamb, the great feast, the great party, where we will be worshiping you forever and ever. So, Lord, we just thank you and praise you for that love, for that grace, for that mercy given through Christ and Christ alone. We pray in the powerful name of Jesus, amen. Thank you, Troy. I don't know if you are um, a bit in awe of this imagery and this picture and, 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 and how biblical and beautiful it is, but this is what Christ has done for you. Listen to the words in 1 John 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin, but if anyone does sin... We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. 
He is the propitiation for our sin. That is the satisfaction of a rightful, justful wrath of God against our sin. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Here we have the gospel message, this incredible truth that Christ has paid the penalty for us. And you've heard the gospel that though we were broken in our sin and separated from God and having no hope to remedy that on our own, God has made the initiative towards you. He, the reconciler, has come in Christ Jesus that you might have life and might have it to the full. And so this morning, if you're not reconciled with Christ, if there's a warring in your spirit against him, if you've never trusted the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, his resurrection from the, day, from the grave, then I pray that today is the day of salvation for you, the day when now you accept this offering of Christ on your behalf that you might have life. If you want to know what that means or what that looks like in your life, we would be honored to speak with you about it. Following the service, uh, I'll be here, or if you're viewing online, you can contact us. We would be honored to talk about how you can know Christ and clearly uh, know where you stand in relationship with him through his word. Praise the Lord. Thank you for this truth, Troy. We're going to hear just a little more in a moment, but I'm going to invite you to stand uh, with me at this time. We're going to sing this song. Uh, and then following that, we'll hear some announcements. Um, but then uh, following that, we're going to hear a, a report as the live stream uh, comes to a conclusion following the announcements. Let's sing and glorify the Lord at this time.
couple quick announcements, um, and then we're going to hear a little bit more. Um, so you'll notice that we're missing a few of our, you guys can have a seat for sure, um, we're missing a few of our college students because they are now back at school, so please be praying for them. Um, if you would like a list of them, like by name and what school they're at, things like that, I'm happy to send that to you, so just contact me and let me know. Um, but we want to be praying for those and those young adults that we have too, um, because this is that transition time of life in college and right after high school and all that is, is a challenge. Most of us know that. So figuring out what we're doing and, and what the path that we're headed down. I realize now at 32, that 18 was not really the age I really should be th have been trying to figure out what I was doing the rest of my life. <laughs> but, um, but God has a plan, and he is, he is absolutely working in their lives. So please, please be praying for those college students. Um, August 27th, so that's coming up next Saturday, is our Discovering NHBC new members class. So for our new members and for those who have been visiting with us, this is an opportunity to either A, fulfill the requirement for membership, or B, learn more about the church body here. Um, it's, a, it's a really great class. It gives so much information and really to get uh, what we believe and our doctrine and that kind of stuff. It's really awesome to hear from that. So if you have not already registered and made sure that we know that you'll be there, please let the church office know um, so we can get your name on that list. Um, September 18th, I'm sure you guys have been seeing what been, we've been posting about it and talking about it. Celebration Sunday, we'll be celebrating 60, I said 18th, right? Okay, that's like extracted. Uh, we'll be celebrating 64 years as a church family, and that is going to be super fun. We're going to be on the back lot and begin praying now for the weather for that day. <laughs> Just start praying now because um, we'll have an inflatable. I've already been like scoping them out. There are some really cool ones locally, so we're going to have that, and we will make sure that it is uh, adult size also so that if anybody who is an adult would like to play on that, you can. Um, and that might be me I'm talking about, but I will be doing that, yes. Um, so that is Celebration Sunday, food, family, it's going to be so fun. So please plan to be here for that. Um, on, and if you would like to help with that in any way, please contact us and let us know, because we will need some help with the setup and things like that. The youth have already said they are excited to help with that and get set up and things, but we will need some, some other hands as well. Um, and October 16th is our chili cook-off. So this is actually the third time we've done this. So um, we weren't able to do it, kind of the COVID stuff kind of messed it up. But this is our third one. So I, have, I know that there are two, two gentlemen specifically that will be trying to fight it out for the title. Since there were two separate years, I think we had two different winners. So um, chili cook-off on October 16th. Um, if you are interested in being a judge for that, please let me know, um, and we will make sure that you get to get to judge that chili cook-off. So plan to be here. Um, if you would like to enter, let me know. Um, I already know. Dennis, you're in. I saw the fist pump back there. He's really excited, so I'm <laughs> definitely, definitely excited about that, too. So any other announcements, make sure you're getting our weekly email, and we'll make sure to get those announcements to you. Thank you, Ashlyn. Appreciate you kind of keeping things moving um, well, uh, we're grateful that you joined us for a live stream, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next week. Tell someone about that. Those of you who are local, we're going to stick around for just another moment. Uh, so we're going to give you an opportunity to finish that up. And um, that being said...